I think it's because it's the uh, the first Friday of the month is the first of the month. You know, it's February first. You think that's why people aren't here? Yeah. Because I've I've had days where I've missed where it's been like. You you sent your uh, notice out at least a week ago. Didn't you? I sent yeah, it out two yeah. weeks ago. Week yeah, or two weeks with ago. about six papers. It's a little uh, overwhelming. I'm sorry about that. I um. I sent those papers. Well, welcome, welcome. Today we're going to talk about lumbar stenosis, and like I'm going to put it on. I'm going to put this lecture on YouTube. Uh, yeah, I sent those lectures out because I found them interesting. Unfortunately, they probably you didn't find them interesting, but I, it's easy for me to just uh, attach it. So before we start today, um, I want to uh, poll everyone. Uh, who do you think is going to win the Super Bowl? I think it's going to be Ravens. Um, Ravens by ten. David. Ten points. Football, a uh, touchdown, and a uh, field goal. How are you, Adam? What's your uh, prediction? I'm Ravens. I haven't thought. I don't think I know enough about the 49ers to. You're not going to give a spread. No. Yeah, I think Ravens are going to win. Yeah. By. 49ers have a solid team, but if they can, if they can get to uh, this, what's his name? Kaepernick. Kaepernick. Yeah. They can yeah. stop him from running. Yeah. Right. Okay, so I was going to start the day with um, mystery slide. So, Adam, I'm sorry to put you on no on the spot right away. So it's a CT scan. But let me let me um yeah let me um it's let me give you the riddle. There's a raven in there someplace, isn't there? There's there's a raven in here, a linebacker. No, I'm just oh, kidding. I see. No, I'm just kidding. There's something in this CT myelogram with it, which is different from usual, and I found it during the surgery, and. It's on the left side, and I was like, what is this? And then I looked at the CT myelogram, and you could see it on the CT myelogram, but I didn't notice it pre-op. So there's something that is different right and left that I should have noted, but I didn't see it because I didn't look carefully. Kind of very subtle. Uh, and the, is there a little membrane or something in the middle? Yeah. No. How about the nerve roots? Compare this one and this one. Well, the one on the left is smaller. The, the amount of CSF in the sheath is okay. smaller. Okay, that's what I said initially. That's was, that was my comment on my interpretation. But on looking closer, um, there's actually two. There's one here, and there's one here. Tendon. Yeah, yeah, or conjoint tendon, nerve root. Conjoint yeah. Nerve root. yeah, so it's an example of a conjoint nerve root. It's yesterday's case. So I didn't notice it, and then I was like, why is there two? And I was like, oh, wow, I wonder if I could have seen that pre-op. And I looked carefully, I was like, oh, yeah, there it is. You know, I, in, in lectures that I go to, you know, where, I, uh, you know, for my CME, they talk about it, and they show cases, mm -hmm. and I look for it, and I know I'm missing it. Because they say that the frequency, I can't remember what the percentage is, whether it's 5% or 10% of people yeah. that have it at a level. And I almost never see it, which just means I'm missing it. You know, because it's over and over again yeah, about it, how, com how, how common it is. It's not of any clinical significance. It's not like you're missing lung well, it's cancer. it's important for you, though. It's important to, for the surgeon, yeah, but... Yeah. Isn't there a second uh, shadow on the on the screen left? This right yeah, here? Yeah, that. Yeah, that. I don't think so. I'm not huh? sure what... That may be the takeoff from the dura. But, yeah, you're right. There's something there. Yeah, but I was I only did a left-sided decompression. Not intense as the other side. Yeah. I'm not sure what that is. You know, there's always a chance it could be an artifact, but th this person had two nerve roots. So, okay, I have another mystery slide. This one, I don't know what this is. So this is really... Some in the iliac crest there. Yeah, right. what is that? Now, I, I think I know what it is, but what do you think it is? Well, the first thing I would think is, has the patient morning, had Doug. surgery there? And no, I'm never had any surgery, nothing. So I think just some Healthy sort of person. synovial cyst from the, from the SI joint that's eroded back. So you think it's... From the sacroiliac joint. I, the other thing I was thinking is it could it be a um, simple bone cyst? Yeah. In the ilium. Have you ever seen that? Yeah. A little bit unusual with that kind of mountain of bone extending Where? into it. From the right here. here. But yeah. Just looking on the on the screen left. Uh huh. Yeah, this thing right here. It kind of like if you look at MRIs all day, it kind of jumps out at you. It's not supposed to be there. So. I, now he's had this for two years. It's geographic and and well defined. Well defined yeah. No limb. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's anything, but um, so you think you would probably guess more synovial cyst. Bone cyst is a great one, but a synovial cyst. The, the anterior aspect of the SI joint is the synovial part. Yeah, could be. It could be coming yeah. from right there. Mm -hmm. Okay, I found that kind of. I'm getting a CAT scan, so I'll share the CAT scan next. Okay, so let's get started. So. 
I was going to go over lumbar stenosis. Good morning, Megan. Good morning. And you see a lot of people bent forward when they walk, like this person. And when I see those people, first thing I think is this person has lumbar stenosis. What do you guys think? Doug, when you're in the grocery store buying bacon and whatever for your children, you see somebody roll through, bent forward, what are you thinking? Total hip replacement? Or no, big surgeons. Osteoporosis. Osteoporosis. Yeah. Osteoporosis yeah. from the thoracic kyphosis. That's what goes to your mind. First thing that goes to my mind is lumbar stenosis. I think she's got uh, osteoporosis and um, from probably thoracic and lumbar, more more from lumbar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, sure. No, I don't think she has spinal stenosis. Sorry. Okay, well that's just, uh, yeah, I'm just asking. That's why we're all together. What do you spinal stenosis people walk a little bit and then stop and sit, sit. and rest and then they go up again. It's a German word for it. something about uh, uh, window shopping, you know, mm -hmm. sort of walk a little bit and the, then sit down. The classic is my dad. I mean, he's a classic Lamar. He's like, I'm, he, we go grocery shopping. He goes, I'm going to sit at the front and um, you go do some shopping. Then he meets me two seconds later. He goes, make sure you get ketchup. He goes back, sits down, and he comes and He's always sitting down. Okay. So, Megan, what do you think? When you see someone like this, what goes through your mind? The parents never told them to stand up straight. Oh, see, the therapist thinks everything is volitional, like <laughs> you can make things better, right? Like no, this person, see, like no, this I person. Agree with you. I mean, most people who present with stenosis have that forward flex bent posture because they want to. But that's the first thing that goes through your mind is that they can do better with volitional uh, activity because you're a physical or their therapist. Strength. Or their strength is yeah, strong. absolutely. Because they're. And it's habitual. It's mm -hmm. just habitual. Absolutely. So we're surgeons. We always think we always think of surgeries whenever we see people. That's the first thing that goes through our minds. So we just, don't want them to have it. huh? No, we like surgeries. <laughs> we like surgeries. So the spine, just to review, is made up of series of blocks, one on top of the other, and each one of these vertebral bodies or bones has a hole in it. Here's the hole, and it's the spinal canal. And this shows you the spinal canal throughout its length, from the brain all the way down to the sacrum to the tip. And it's got its own characteristic, characteristic shape at every level. And the area in the spine gets larger in the lower cervical area. Um, and who can guess why it's the spinal cord and the fecal sac is bigger at C5, C6, C7? Just think of, anybody has screaming answers? How about just think of Nate. Nate's got these big muscles in his arms and stuff. What, what nerve roots? work his big muscles, his arms. Five, six, seven. See, five, six, seven, yeah. So, thoracic spine, like Nate's thoracic spine, I could easily overcome his intercostal muscles. They're these tiny little things between his ribs. So he doesn't need neurological structures from T1 to T12. But C567 is where all the innervation comes from when he throws footballs and things like that. Big head up, that's, that's another topic. And the, and the spinal canal should be around um, in general, lumbar, we're talking lumbar spine today, maybe say L3, 22 by 15. And the range, the low range is 11. So the smallest mid-sagittal diameter AP is 11 millimeters. And inside the spinal canal are the spinal cord and nerve roots, and the spinal cord ends usually L1, L2. And, and below L2 is all nerve roots, which we call the chondroequina. equina. At each level, there's a hole where the nerve runs out, you see the pencils inside of it, and that's the foramen. So at each level, another nerve comes out. And it, what's interesting, at the level of the foramen, you also have on the back side, you have the facet, and on the front side, you have the disc. So that's the level of the disc and the foramen and the facet is where all the action comes from, in my mind, because that's where things get stenotic. Now, stenosis is when the spinal canal gets small. And things will get more interesting, but I'm just reviewing things. This, the spinal canal gets small by either posterior uh, disc herniation or posteriorly ligamentum flavum that comes from the facet. And between each bone is a ligamentum flavum. So between each lamina is this ten, like, ligamentous structure, like an ACL, like a mini ACL, connect, ACL connecting both bones. And it can get hypertrophic. But what's interesting, like Doug, does does the ACL ever get hypertrophic? Like the ligamentum flavum? Not that I remember. Never heard of that? No. Don't you think it's kind of odd that the ligamentum flavum gets hypertrophic? I mean, it can get really big sometimes. Do you know of any other ligament that gets hypertrophic? 
maybe the cruciate ligament at C1, C2. But, you know, going across the back of the dens. That thing gets big. You're talking like rheumatoid arthritis when yeah. it gets synovitis. That, I think that's more of a synovitis type picture where, where the, like in rheumatoid arthritis, when you cut it, what's the synovium like, Doug, in a rheumatoid arthritis patient? Because you've cut those out before. Synovium of rheumatoid, it's uh, inflamed. It's usually very wet. Uh, it's sort of red, irritated, um, hypertrophic. So it's much thicker and bigger right. than a normal synovium. Like normal synovium is like right. what? Normal synovium is like a balloon, almost, you know, thin skin. Like a one to two millimeters. But syno but in root, so I think it's more of a hypertrophic synovium, okay. more so than the ligament. <laughs> okay, so Adam, what you, is this, um, does this describe this um, lumbar spine for everybody? Well, it, the first word out of my mouth would be it's no, normal. But yeah, I know. See, it's, for you, it's so simple. But for uh, other people, we don't know why it's so, normal. Why is it normal? Well, you can look at all the vertebral bodies, and they're nice and square, uh -huh. and the margins are all well defined. And then you look at the discs, and mm -hmm. they're uh, sort of juicy white, with mm -hmm. the white being water on a T2 weighted image. Uh -huh. and they're all little pillows and well defined. And, uh -huh. um, the, the posterior margin, you can kind of draw a smooth line down the posterior margin. It doesn't really bulge at all right there, maybe at L5S1. Maybe a tiny There's a bit. a small mm -hmm. partial or annular tear and a mm -hmm. disc bulge. Mm -hmm. um, but, and then the spinal canal, we're right there, just wide open. You know, all that is just mm -hmm. a, a nice, smooth mm -hmm. surface. How about this? What's this black line here? Um, this blackness? Connecting it's, lamina to lamina. Yeah, it's it's li the ligament mm -hmm. um, in between the the bone. Mm -hmm. Ligament and flavum. Yeah. And what are these things here? The spinous processes. Mm -hmm. there so that tells you you're in the midline. Yeah. So all these things that Adam says makes it makes you think this is a normal MRI. So here's L5 S1. What does this look like? Well, it's a, it's asymmetric. Uh, it's the first thing. If you think of uh, Mickey Mouse with the head and then the ear. Um, and the right ear right there is uh, is here. Well, no, that sorry the the I was talking to patients right. The left of the on the left image go down mm -hmm. under the L. Mm -hmm. with, no, over to the right more uh -huh. the, the with the nerve sheath. This the, yeah, right mm -hmm. there. There's the ear, and you can see the ear is right there. Oh, the Mickey Mouse is the thecal sac. Yeah, the thecal okay. sac. Okay, sorry. Okay. So there's the ear, and you can see that he is using. When we look at these, the patient's feet are at our face and the head is away from us. Mm -hmm. So they're lying on their back with their feet at our face and their head away from us. So therefore, where your arrow right there is the right. Mm -hmm. So that is the, the, the right ear there is that mm -hmm. right nerve and that's gonna be the right L5 nerve mm -hmm. going out through it. And you can see on the left, there isn't one. Mm -hmm. So there's something in that space mm -hmm. that is uh, taking up, that's doing something to mm -hmm. the nerve um, and something in that space. Mm -hmm as to why that's not normal. So it looks like two things to me. Why are there two things? Well, there's there's the anterior and, there's mm -hmm. the, the anterior and dorsal nerves mm -hmm. that come together to form the, uh, the L5. The nerve root. Mm -hmm. So the rootlets and then the, the nerve root itself. And it's still got a little bit of CSF. And, and this thecal sac adheres to the, the nerve root right out here in the foramen. Um, and it becomes perineurium. And here inside inside is the fecal sac and if you had to guess if this if you had to guess what nerve root is this one um, that exiting l well l5 s1 oh yeah so oh, i'll think this is probably five yeah five and this is one s1 and this one two s2 and three. this one s3 and you can't see three and four for some reason it's an open magnet for some reason it doesn't i don't know why you can't see it so can you, these are all normal, so this is not a trick question. Okay. Like L405, how do you know this is L405? Or do you know, or can you guess, or? I cannot tell. So I kind of look at the psoas muscle, see how big it is, mm -hmm. and I always, I always look at that, and I always look out here to see if anything's hitting the rootlets out here when they exit. And the L3 nerve root would be out here somewhere within the psoas itself. And we know this through the, um, the nuvasive, uh, lateral approaches to the discs where they fuse it, they go through this muscle and they go basically blindly and with a with an uh, EMG and they see if the nerve's in the way. So those nerve roots are within here somewhere in the lumbar plexus. So three, four, now we're getting a little higher. This person had a foraminal disc herniation and the psoas is not as big because it's at the beginning. Two, three, it's, it's much uh, smaller. 
spinal canal is nice and big. See how many rootlets there are here compared to down here? Because they're all leaving, they're exiting. So the thecal sac is kind of empty down here because they've all left, but here they're, they're all there. And this, what do you what do you think this is? This black muscular diaphragm. diaphragm. Yep. And the end of the spinal cord of the conus. And T11, T12. And the thoracic spine canal is a little bit smaller than the lumbar spine. And uh, I have an evolutionary theory. Does anybody have an evolutionary theory why you don't need a big spinal Doesn't canal? Move. Doesn't move. Yeah, in the ribs. So you have relative stenosis. I mean, relative uh, stability in the thoracic spine that, that in, inherently in the lumbar spine it moves, so you need a lot more uh, room for these rootlets. Okay. So here's a case. Um, Doug, this man's coming into your office, 85 years old, and he has low back pain, sciatica. And um, Adam, this is not a trick question, but just, just uh, what are your x ray interpretations? So it's a. a two views, an a, a frontal view on the left mm -hmm. and a lateral view on the right. Mm -hmm. um, and you can see he's, he's probably a pretty big guy because we're, how poorly we're seeing the outline of- mm -hmm. the, He is a big guy. Mm -hmm. Of the L5 uh, uh, vertebral body on, mm -hmm. the, on the lateral, you, can, uh -huh. you can't really see it. And you know, he's got iliac crest over there, he's got the bone, so it's just, there's a lot of uh, fat attenuating mm -hmm. the x-ray beam. Um, the alignment looks pretty good. Uh, but he does have some degenerative disc disease, and I would say that degenerative disc disease is manifested on the x-ray by some loss of disc height, some mm -hmm. in-plate sclerosis, and mm -hmm. some small anterior osteophytes extending off of, at the disc space, Maybe showing you that there's bulging bit. discs. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what, do you, um, so what are your thoughts, Doug? Just oh, and he's had a left hip uh, prosthesis. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts, Doug, on something like the low back pain, sciatica? He says he gets back pain, but when he sits down, it goes away. What do you do? First office visit. He takes an occasional leave. Um, I would uh, check his vascular system first because I'd be very concerned that he might have some vascular insufficiency. Mm -hmm. Plus, he's a uh, normal posterior right. tibialis pulses. And then, um, yeah, and then also looking, I don't, I don't see much calcification of his aorta or anything. So. Mm -mm. And then it's pretty good for 85, no calcium in there. Yeah, it looks like he's got a lot of fat and a lot mm -hmm. of uh, air, a lot of uh, colonic contents. Mm -hmm. um, what do you do with him? Send him, I mean, look at Megan, she needs business. Send him to Megan. 85, boy, I think she'd hurt him a little bit. Maybe. Well, let's ask, let's ask Megan. And Megan, what can, you, what can you do for this man? Well, if they present with sciatica, I usually do a, flex, a flexion based program. Um, working on flexion, but then I also try to stretch the psoas out because if they're sitting all the time, their psoas is... Stretch the psoas with hip extension? With hip, yes, but you have to be mm -hmm. very careful because you can't put their spine into extension because that's going to exacerbate the symptoms. But if they're standing up and you want them to stand up a little bit more and their hip flexors are tight, they're just going to extend through the lumbar spine, which is going to make things worse. How can, you, how can you extend the hip without extending the spine, too? Um, a lot of times I put them, I try to put them in a little bit of prone and start with just doing some Prone position? Quad, prone quad stretches. And then I also work, sometimes I get to the tech in there and hold so that they're not extending at the spine mm -hmm. and pull back. You can do it. Well, I'm interested to hear this because I my, I obviously sit all day long. I mean... How do, so do you prone lying on their stomach on the... And then what you... What I first start with is put pillows underneath their belly. Okay. And then I just first start with quad stretches to see if I can get their quads to the full length to get that first part of the joint, and then after I get that nice, I start taking pillows away and seeing if I can get them to promote more towards extension. Or I lay them sideline and have a second person at the level of the pelvis to try and- To push it forward like the full yeah. Yep, and I can pull back so that they're not compensating with extension. Trying to make their hips more flexible. And mm -hmm. really, the hip rotators as mm -hmm. well as because usually if they sit all the mm -hmm. time, they're tight anyway. Mm -hmm. And they can't, they can't extend and get straight because mm -hmm. they're so absent. Maybe help their posture and their balance. Okay. All right, so what do you think, Adam, here of uh, this MRI? Well, it's it's uh, not normal. As mm -hmm. uh, we went, as we said, I why, quickly with the other one. Why so is what, it normal? Well, you can see it uh, at almost every level of the lumbar spine. There is black. Uh -huh. um, again, this is a T2 weighted image where water is white uh -huh. um, and CSF water. is white. Uh -huh. And like that first one where there was a nice road of white 
all the way through the lumbar spine here. Let's look at let's look at the last one. So here's the Adam at so the Adam Road. Yeah, it's nice. Big and wide white open. road, it's wide a, open. It's a highway or a big canal. Big canal. Whereas here, there's narrowing at every disc space level. You don't see it at all. Mm -hmm. And you can see the the spinal cord comes down a little bit low too. That's uh -huh. a, it's sort of right behind L two is the conus medullaris. There. Uh -huh. um, so that it's a little lower, but not that doesn't have too much of it. So. But where I'm looking is at the disc spaces, and right there, it's narrowed. You go down one more, it's narrowed. You go down one more, and it's you know it's all. Very narrow, very poor. So it's compressed from, you said this disc bulge, and what's this back here? That's the ligamentum flavum. So ligamentum flavum hypertrophy posteriorly. You can see this whole thing is ligamentum flavum. So the question sometimes I think is, is this ligamentum flavum uh, co compressed, you think, because it, the disc, if the disc flattens, this thing flattens too, and it maybe it just buckles, or is it hypertrophic? I would say hypertrophic. The disc heights, I don't think. Those disc looks pretty good, yeah. yeah. So I would think so too. And the other thing, it could be ligament, ligament and flame. The other thing could be is capsular tissue. Capsular tissue will look like that. Yeah, and I can't I, tell the difference. Yeah, and also cortical bone, like a facet bone. Yeah, hypertrophic and, uh, well, facet. and a hypertrophic bone will push the facet out. You could have the mm -hmm. same thickness facet, but if you've got a big bone behind it that's mm -hmm. hypertrophied out, it's going to mm -hmm. push that same facet, ligament. Uh, okay, so what do you think of L5S1? So the, the spinal canal is actually is not it, it's it's not very bad in terms uh -huh. of how much space is still left in there, but it is being narrowed by that black tissue on posterior lateral margins, which is a thickened ligament. Right here. So I, so what objective reasons? If you had to tell a computer this is not bad, what would you tell the computer to know what's bad, what's not bad? The amount of CSF that still so, remains. So you see plenty of intervening CSF between all the nerve all roots. The nerves. And also what objective measure? Spinal canal, would you say? Yeah. Size you, of the spinal canal is pretty good. Yeah. Because most human beings are relatively similar size. So what do you think of four or five? So here now there's there's no CSF left, really, mm -hmm. maybe a few drops mm -hmm. of, of CSF and uh, right, like maybe right here. They're all being compressed and this is one of the ones where I would say the triad of disease of set arthropathy, ligamental thickening, and disc mm -hmm. bulge. And disc bulge, right. Yeah, and I would say that I would give this a, a moniker of severe spinal canal stenosis because I don't see any CSF remaining. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that drop in the back of bright light, you know, bright signals, probably maybe fat. A little bit of fat. And this, these are cases when, in the OR, when they stick a needle and the anesthesiologist is like, I know I'm in the spinal canal, I know I'm in the spinal canal, but no fluid comes out because there is no fluid there. It's, and, and it happens all the time. So th this is, I would say that's severe too. So, so here's, that's four or five, and then just like four millimeters up, what do you look at L4 pedicle? What do you think? It looks really good. So there's, pl there's plenty of room, right? Mm -hmm. At the level of the pedicle. And then how about three, four? Three, four is also severe. It's a mm -hmm. little triangle of somewhere in there, there's the tissue the, of the nerves and the dural sac, but there's no CSF. And mm -hmm. you can see the facet hypertrophy, how big they are, sort of mm -hmm. the roundingness of the, the curve nature of the facet joint uh -huh. because of it, the hyperostatic bone and then the fluid in there. Well, this is white stuff is the fluid? It's the fluid, mm -hmm. synovial fluid. What's this black stuff? Cortex. So Cort cortical yeah, bone. Yeah, cortical bone, maybe cartilage, but it's probably some cortical Some bone. cartilage, and maybe some cartilage and cortical bone. Okay. So L3, L4 is uh, severely stenotic. And then at L3, just two millimeters up, what do you think? Looks good again, wide open, lots of fluid surrounding all the nerves. Do you think this person has short pedicles or no? As a uh, they contributor? Are, they are. Yeah, um, yeah, you can see how uh, horizontally ovoid the canal is there rather than circular. And if yeah. you made the pedicles longer, you would give them more anterior, posterior dimension space. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the, the pedicles are short. Probably short. Let's look at four. Let's see, it's four. Hard to say, but three it definitely looks short. And there's two, round. three. What? Two, three. Get most of the CSF is gone. You can mm -hmm. imagine a, a dots there of nerves mm -hmm. with some interposed CSF. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but you could really get a good idea of just the facet arthropathy, the ligamental thickening here, and mm -hmm. seeing how much that is extending in. You can imagine if that wasn't there, the, mm -hmm. the canal really wouldn't be that bad. This is mostly the posterior elements that are causing the problem rather than the disc. The disc mm -hmm. is still kind of concave um, mm -hmm. there, so it's it's uh, not really contributing much. Mm -hmm.
and then you, if you go up to that, you can see a bit more. Go ahead, keep it. Yeah, there, the roundness of the L2 yeah. relative to L3. So L2, you have a pretty good spinal canal. How about L1, L2? L1, L2 is, again, it's a, a, a moderate canal stenosis with most of the CSF being displaced out of the dural sac. You can see the thickened ligament. You can see the hypertrophic facets. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... Um, this just goes to show what normally you have a large spinal canal both views and you can look go from lamina to the vertebral body to see the s size of the spinal canal and also in the axial cut you can even measure it maybe and it just um, just this is just an example of what's normal so the spinal canal should be sort of round should have plenty of room for the nerve roots and uh, same here at the in the cervical spine so the standard, so any questions about the spinal stenosis, what it looks like, what, how it manifests on MRI, usually MRI diagnosis. So the standard is just the old school is laminectomy. You cut either side and you lift it off and you can really decompress the nerve roots that way. But you strip both sides, I'll show you the muscles when you do that, and also this somewhat weakens the spine and the bones can slide afterwards. You can just, oh, just a one level decompression you have to focus on the facets. So here's the facet area. So you want to focus on the facets and make sure you look into the frame and in the pars area, underneath the pars, but you don't want to weaken the pars because then you get a pars fracture and spondylolysis. I don't decompress this much, but I don't think most people do, but you, you want to at least see the root somewhat and undermine the pars somewhat. And, and you can see that what, what, this is what I mean when I say at the level of the disc and the level of the facet, that's the business area because that's the area that's, that needs decompressing, not the area up here where the pedicle is. So you don't need really to do a full laminectomy. You just need to decompress this segment usually. And this, this technique is called the porthole technique. And here's the ligamentum flavum below and above. And you see how that whole ligamentum flavum is gone. And the facets are decompressed as well. And if you can see, the, this decompression is a little bit too much because they did it on purpose just to show you. But you want to, I think, decompress just to the level of the dura and not more um, because this doesn't give you any added benefit you don't need extra room so you can do this this porthole technique at multiple segments and it was first in the, in the literature described in 2000 by this Kleeman and Chuck Edwards is my former partner he's the one who taught him how to do it and then what I sent everybody in the articles is this unilateral laminectomy bilateral decompression which is very similar, but you can do the whole thing from just one side, and that leaves this all this muscle intact. So it, this is even less invasive, and you can go all the way up and down the spine if you connect them. And that's how I've been doing it. And the reason why we can do this now, and we couldn't do it 15 years ago, is the microscopes are better. So you can operate through these tubes because the fiber optic light's better, and the agility of the microscope has gotten much, much better. It used to be a real hassle to move the microscope, so in other words, you look here, look there, look here, look there, look here. When you're doing your loops, you just move your head. But in the microscope, you have to move the whole microscope. And it used to be a real hassle to move the microscope because it wasn't agile. And it would take you like 10 seconds and you, you didn't know where you were. And it, was like, it wasn't easy. But now it's so easy that you can do these things through small incisions because of the agility of the microscope, I think. And all the instruments have gotten better too because they realize people are using small tubes. And you can do, you can just carry this trough all the way up and down the spine and open up the spinal canal in the entire spinal canal. Um, okay, so any questions about decompressions or? All right, so next case is um, this pa this patient uh, couldn't get a hold of me, Doug, and she came to your office. And her story is she's 66 and she has low back pain and right leg pain. And she had a decompression initially in 95 that went well, but then she had recurrent stenosis and had spondylolisthesis. And then I did a revision decompression from L3 to L5 and I fused 4-5 because she had a spondylolisthesis in January 2010. She came back to my office in June. She said her right leg hurt and I got an MRI and it was totally normal. So I was like, I, I'm not sure what to do. I just gave her medicines. And she came back again a year later and says, I'm worse now. I have severe right leg pain. Now, what do you, what, uh, Adam, what do you think of the uh, x rays? You can see that L4 is anteriorly listed on L5 by a little bit there. Mm -hmm. The 
you can see the position of the, uh, the screws and the fixation looks pretty good. Mm -hmm. you know, a little bit proud on L5 coming out mm -hmm. through the anterior cortex. Mm -hmm. um, looks maybe some of the under. I, I, did you take off some of the underside of the L4 lamina? Maybe here. Yeah. Yeah, I fully decompressed it. Okay. You'll see in a second in the MRI. Um, and then there's the, the lateral hypertrophic bone at the level of the facet, best seen on the AP, yeah, mm -hmm. out there. Is that more than what you usually see? Yeah, but it's bone graft that's put you, out there. You know why I use BMP in her? She, she had a really big, robust fusion mass. I'll show you on the CAT scan. So that helps to use the posterior elements to give it stability. Right, fusion. And then what do you think of 3-4? Is that normal or? It's narrowed, yeah, at posteriorly at 3-4. Mm -hmm. It's narrowed posteriorly. Okay. You know, as we've talked about a lot in this conference is that if you can't move at 4-5, mm -hmm. you know, then you end up usually moving a bit more above and below. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, Jason's segment's generation. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. So what do you think, uh, Doug, what do you want to do with her now? It's getting worse. She had a normal MRI a year ago, and she says, I'm getting worse now. I'm tired of seeing Megan. It's not helping. Uh, and you say the MRI is normal. A year ago. Yeah. She's back in your office. And what do I do now? And she's just got right sided pain. Right sciatica. And it's a normal MRI. Mm. How often do you order MRIs? I mean, if someone sees you today, normal MRI, comes back a week later, I'm worse. Do you get another MRI no. a week later? No. So do you have any time frame where you should get MRIs? I know Adam probably thinks you should have a daily MRI, right? Every day. I don't think Adam thinks that at all. I no, I'm just that, kidding. Uh, I'm just I think kidding. that um, a month is probably the minimum that I would be ordering a repeat MRI. Mm -hmm. um, For cancer, it's what, three months usually? Like, <coughs> uh, it varies. It, the, the oncologists, where they are in, in therapy, they order it a lot more, sometimes more frequently. Like three, six months. I've seen yeah. that follow up in it, three or six months. I've seen it, well, I mean, it depends on what you're looking for. If you're if you have a, something you think is benign mm -hmm. and you want to follow it to make sure it is benign, mm -hmm. you know, three to six months is sort of the minimum because you need to give it a chance to change if to it is grow. cancer. To mm grow. -hmm. But um, if you're if you know it's cancer and you're actively getting chemotherapy and you want to see how it responds to chemotherapy. Mm -hmm. You know, a month is very reasonable to get a follow-up. So do like cancer, one month of chemo, and then look if the tumor shrunk? Yeah. yeah and if the tumor sure. hasn't shrunk, they'll do something different? Change the chemo, right. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Bunch of hokum. <clears throat> you know, my, my brother, to, to, di to digress. Remember, everything everything is uh, on YouTube, so PG. You know, my, my, my brother is an oncologist, mm -hmm. and I uh, have a close friend who's just been diagnosed here with uh, a malignancy. Uh -huh. <clears throat> and, um, you know, I think it's sad, but I don't think she has a chance. You know, from data, it's, uh, from the articles I've read, she's got about a two-month life expectancy. Mm -hmm. And so we sort of negotiate, you know, talked about whether it was appropriate for her to have chemotherapy. You know, they've done everything. They've done an MRI. They've mm -hmm. done a PET scan. Uh -huh. And... Um, you know, a lot of the oncologists, you don't become an oncologist by telling people there's nothing I can do for you. you right. Know, people always grab of course. that one, one out of a million chance. Oncologists will never tell you th what your life expectancy is. They don't care. Right. And, and But I think that a lot of the, um, a lot of the trend that, that I'm aware of has gone away from imaging, and it's sort of looking at uh, markers now, you know. Um, tumor markers. Tumor markers, mm -hmm. which are much more effective because you know if you get an image and, and like you know she's got disease and, and she's got ascites I mean if you get an image you don't need an image to tell you that she's got ascites or or that the tumor isn't getting you know better she's still got ascites but the you know the markers are a little bit better. I think it's everything in oncology I mean my friends an oncologist and I send I tell them the cases I had a case of like whatever they are can you go he says things like was she four five seven positive was she six right. two three I was like what right. are you talking about right. It's like, for, it's like, oh, uh, it's, it's that's like the first thing. It's a whole new yeah. alphabet of incredible tumor markers. Yeah. That, you know, a lot of the people here, don't, you know, I, I don't even think they're so aware of them sometimes. No, they are. You've talked to. Um, right. But next month is going to be the tumor conference here. So we're going to have hopefully Dixon here and an oncologist, and he'll talk to you right. about it. You know, but their pancreas tumor markers, you know, and it's, yeah. it's very... Uh, they send them off here. They, I mean, they don't do the test here. But what you do is those markers cha uh, change as a result of chemotherapy more than imaging. Yeah. They're more significant. So yeah. back to this person. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, 
I'm not, I guess that's labeled correctly. To me, the bottom uh, pedicle screws look, I'm not sure if they're optimal. I'd, I'd probably like to see a, a CT to see if there's nerve. Okay, uh, we'll get you a, we'll get, we'll get you your CT. You don't, you don't think I did a good job? We'll get you a I CT. I didn't know you did these, and I don't know, but you know, if the person is continuing to have pain, um, you know, one of two things m make me think of either she's got uh, impingement with the hardware or her fusion mass is mm -hmm. compromising her. Non-union effusion, right. Or maybe, okay. Non-union or hypertrophic. Okay. Uh, I mean, I, I think, you know, the, the MRI needs to be viewed again to make sure that it was adequate. Often the metal can, mm -hmm. uh, can hide um, stuff and we just can't see it and where you'd have to say maybe get a CT myelogram. Um, because okay. that can deal better with uh, seeing the metal and then seeing the dural sac and where the nerves are. Yeah, I look at every one of my studies. I look at every MRI and CT. I never accept a... You don't trust Adam? Uh, I, trust, I, trust, but I, trust, I trust, but I verify. Yeah. Oh, are you a Ronald Reagan fan? Me too. All right, so what do you think of the fusion mass here in the CAT scan? It's uh, not fused there. You can see right there. Yeah, okay, uh, suspicious lucency. there. Maybe a lucency there. How about are the screws okay? Because he was um, Douglas image, suspicious. Yeah, on that image, they look good. Bullseye on that image on the sagittal cut. How about the fusion mass here? Still suspicious or yeah. still bad? I'm suspicious. Screws look okay. Yes. I look here in the frame and make sure the frame right. doesn't have a screw. And this is where the facet should be. How about here? You see a facet sort of here. Yeah, but I'm looking for a sagittal cut more than anything. For, for screw placement. For an axial cut? Yeah. Okay. Here's um, L3, L4. Is there any problems at the level above, Adam? What do you think? There's facet arthropathy there. Mm -hmm, both got, sides. Okay. Yeah, you can see the, the decompression, the laminar gap. Mm -hmm. for, Nothing obvious on the right. You can right. see this is a unilateral laminectomy, bilateral decompression. See and how both you sides are open? the sagittals, you can actually see that the 3, 4 disc, you can see it. And it's really not yep. very big. Right there? Yeah. Okay. Okay. How about the MRI? So there, uh, the MRI, um, that, the circle there, mm -hmm. you can see that there is a what is that? disc. There's this it's some, like some fluid. Uh, it's probably synovial cyst mm -hmm. is uh, there mm -hmm. in the spinal canal causing mm -hmm. some... Disc is bulging. Mm -hmm. Yep. L5-S1, how's that look? Good. Okay, so 3-4 looks... So here's, um, remember you were concerned um, whether I did a good job with the decompression? What are your thoughts here? This is at 4-5. That looks good. Looks good. This is at 3-4. So the canal is narrowed. Mm -hmm. um, and it's a set of hypertrophy, mm -hmm. like metal thickening. Mm -hmm. It looks more right side than left at 3-4. It's at 3-4 again. And it's definitely narrowed. You can see. Uh, mm -hmm. But down here, you've got where, right where your cursor is, all the way there, and then moving the cursor to the right on the screen. Mm -hmm. That is your laminar defect. Um, so mm -hmm. the, the hard part for these on MRIs, differentiating what is scar tissue um, or some other tissue. So what is all this here? This is all disc material? or Well, back that, that far back, it's scar tissue. This but is as scar. You, as you go more anterior, um, it, Figuring out what is what is very difficult to do. Okay, but here's the thecal sac. Do you agree with that? Uh, yes. No? Okay, yes. So okay. The right side is abnormal mm -hmm. there. Yeah. So this is, I think, with uh, dye. That shows you the decompression, 4-5. Uh, so what do you think of 3-4? So uh, it's four? all enhancing tissue. And, mm -hmm. uh, disc tissue, you know, we've talked about is avascular. Mm -hmm. and so it does not enhance. Mm -hmm. So this is all enhancing tissue. Mm -hmm. um, it is all bright, um, and uh, so that it is not disc tissue, but it is scar tissue, mm -hmm. um, because that does it is usually hypervascular. This is the, this is probably scar, but this is this scar. Looks like it's coming right out of the synovia facet. So that could be the cyst. Yeah. Cyst. Okay, I think that's a three four cyst. Um. So here again, it's a three four. So I, this was a case of uh, recurrent stenosis uh, at L three L four, the level above the fusion from a uh, right sided large synovial cyst, which interestingly developed over the course of a year. And the initial MRI was normal. Maybe that was just instability, and it was starting to form, and it got bigger. So it's always the thing we learned in residency: the only X-ray you regret is the one you didn't get. So I don't know if we could say the same thing for an MRI, but you never said that. The only X-ray you regret is the one you didn't get.
No? Okay, maybe it's just my program. So um, so what would you do? Just, this is not a trick question. If you got this woman, still has pain. Well, you know, it seems that she's got pain at a level above now, mm -hmm. so that needs to be addressed. And um, uh, I would probably uh, take out the facet joint. And I'm mm -hmm. not sure, I, I guess the, uh, the spine surgeon question is, do you, ex do you need to extend the fusion up the level? But, uh, mm -hmm. I think so, because it's real hard to do it. You've destabilized uh, half of her, uh, you've given her half. She's right. got a hypermo hypermobile segment there already, and you're taking away 50% of her stability, so. I think so. And the other thing, it's above a fusion. So if there maybe you could maybe do it if there wasn't a fusion. But the fact that there is a fusion, I think it'd be really hard. Yeah. So she just had a revision decompression. It's been fusion. She did real well, but still has numbness in her right leg somewhat. Hmm. So just in general. Well, some people mm -hmm. do a uh, facet fusion, too. I don't know. Facet fusion? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've used the facets. What do you mean? Do you mean by itself? Yeah. They put a screw across the facet? Right. Yeah. That's been around for a long time. I think that's, uh, I'm not what? sure if it's a reasonable option, but do you think, you know, you, um, you know, for a smaller joint, we would, you know, just sort of uh, excise the uh, cartilage and, and fuse it? Um, you can, there is, a, it's a described technique where you put bone inside of it and then you put a tiny screw across the facet. The facet's really small. It's right. hard to get it just right. right. Pedicle screw is by far, I think, the best way to instrument a spine. Right. Um, but that is an option. So, so any questions about that case? So it was a, a case of adjacent segment degeneration uh, from previous fusion and initial films were normal. What about just sticking a needle in there and sucking out the synovium? That's the I don't have any conventionalist yeah. way to think of it. I don't have any experience with that. Some people do do that. So for yeah. set cysts, they put a needle. I guess the worst case scenario is you have a spinal fluid leak and it recurs, yeah. or you don't get it. It's possible. I don't have any experience with that. Does anybody know anything about that? It's it's, it's an option. Okay. So just uh, and I'm uh, any other comments or questions. So just to, just to go over, you know, in history, people they lean forward, they have pain down their legs, and you know, when I see this man in the grocery store, I mean, he definitely has lumbar stenosis. But Megan thinks he's just not, he's just not, he's not trying, he's not trying. His eyesight's uh, bad. He's got to bend over to read the label. Maybe he can't see. He didn't bring his reading glasses. Sure. He's just he's, he's pushing a cart. yeah. He should have the cart, but he's you know trying to make a go of it. So. Um, we just talked about the facets, the ligament and flavum. Doug always pointed out that anytime you have pain in the leg, it could be vascular. It may not be obvious, like in this case. And sometimes it's subtle, and to always be suspicious and uh, um, uh, get uh, at least feel for pulses and look at the warmth. Extension makes the ligament and flavum buckle worse, so it makes the pain worse. Things to worry about is when the people say the pain's at night, the pain's at rest. They, uh, you're suspicious for a cancer and infection. Other people that you should not sort of ignore if they have low back pain, IV drug abusers, people with urosepsis, weight loss, uh, ankylosing spondylitis, they may have a serious problem like a abscess or a tumor. Uh, talked about depression, differential diagnosis, we just go through this. Cardioquinus syndrome is in the when you have severe compression of the nerve roots uh, in the lower back they could affect the bowel and bladder control. Uh, you get saddle anesthesia. It's like you sit on a saddle with pain on it, and then you look where the pain is. That whole area gets numb. That's a, that's a surgical emergency. And it's an emergency because if you lose your bowel and bladder control, it may not come back. So you have to do whatever you can to take the pressure off the nerves so that you don't have uh, permanent loss of bowel and bladder control. And it's the sacral nerve roots, and so it's the perineum. And people usually don't like talking about their perineum. Like if you say, "Hey, Doug, how are you doing?" Oh, my perineum's numb. It's like what? So people don't like don't like talking about it. You have to ask them, uh, and they don't like talking about it because it's you know, like you learn that. I teach that to my children when they're five years old. You don't touch other people's private areas. You don't talk about it. You know, it's private. I ask it every every vacation. Yeah, yeah, you should because they're not going to talk about it. They think they're embarrassed or whatnot, and it could be you know, it's a serious problem. Well, you have to tell them, I have to ask you this because it may be a sign of a serious problem. And, you know, the patient, patients are okay when you describe that. It's hard to diagnose bladder um, uh, abnormalities. Sometimes you need a bladder scan. So I think a lot of these treatments, they work in breaking a pain cycle. That's what I tell people is that when you have pain, you take it easy. Um, 
and then you get weak and then you're afraid to do anything you don't want to like like uh, you don't want to play football anymore and then it, the, the pain just keeps getting worse and worse and worse so that's I think how Megan really helps people is that my philosophy is she breaks pain cycles and she shows them that you can move you can strengthen things you can get back to your life and people are okay and the never a no pain no gain but a lot of people come in with that mentality with lumbar issues and spinal issues I'm always very cautious of explaining to them that these exercises shouldn't hurt that this should be the stretching will be painful but the strengthening exercises shouldn't hurt and that usually kind of helps them along the way and now we have aquatics so that's going to make things a lot better you don't like no I like no pain no gain you don't like that Not saying all the time. really that's one of my favorite things to say no pain no gain so, so you break pain cycles, and if you can break pain cycles with medicines, although they can cause problems, give you heart attacks and bleed in your stomach. Tell people maybe just rest from things that hurt. We talked about therapies. And that's it. So any questions about lumbar the synesis? One. What? I hate that over-the-door traction unit. You know, I love that. The over-the-door one? No, Saunders is much better. The, uh, what? I love the over-the-door. The people at Harford County, they love that. When you I say I'm going to give you a traction to throw over the top of the door, they love never it. never get that one. What do you get? I, I usually get the Saunders one. It's one that you lay down. It looks like a normal like cervical traction. It just hugs right up here, right at the occiput. Well, how does it pull? Um, it uses hydraulics. It's got a... Um, I think people in Harvard County, they like old, they're old school. They like the thing over the door. TMJ issues. Huh? TMJ? No, this guy's not going to get TMJ. Look, he's, he looks happy. <laughs> <laughs> That's the people yeah, from Harvard, huh? I, 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 I have, in ten years, I have only ordered like one of them. Really? Yeah. David, I, what would you rather have? Would you rather hydraulic or over the door? He's David's old school Harvard County. Yeah, I think I, uh, I'd hang myself. Yeah. See, he's, <laughs> <laughs> he's old school. Like, <laughs> if it doesn't work out. Uh, so what? All right. That, that's it for any other questions. Huh? <laughs> any questions or comments? Yeah, Lumbar I, I have a question. Or the Ravens game. We can talk about Ravens game. Um, I saw a, a teenage girl um, with back pain. Back pain, back pain, back pain. Okay. Normal x-rays. Okay. And um, she sort of had a stiff, straight lumbar spine. She had okay. difficulty moving. It's like 15 or something? Yeah. Four, okay. 13 or 14. Okay. She's uh, African-American. She's a little bit overweight, but she's pretty normalish. Otherwise. Okay. Okay. And so I ultimately got a um, an MRI on her spine, okay. and it showed uh, facet hyper um, uh, like fluid in the facet joints or f facet inflammation. Okay. What would you think of the, that? Do you think that's like post uh, post viral syndrome or something? Oh. Uh, okay. So if the synovium specific for something, it's possible. I mean, kids get these weird. You see, you've seen kids with these weird synovitis. Right. right and you have no idea what it is right. and it goes away right. and, it, and it's a, and I, my own son had it he's like, he had a knee flexion contracture I was like what my own son's got an orthopedic problem it just went away and we thought it was limes we were all going crazy mm -hmm. a week it was gone so so the facet can be attacked like with all joint problems just like right. gout can hit the facet I'm sure you can get a synovitis facet but I'd be I would be very um, suspicious that she has some kind of spondylolisthesis and it's manifested uh, with increased uh, facet space because when you lay flat in the scanner, the spondylolisthesis reduces, and then you see a gap within the facet because normally it's it's subluxated. And I would also think pars fracture, or pars stress, or pars like fracture, weakness, right? I think of an MR. But she had like multiple levels, you know, like really? three or four. Yeah, it wasn't just one level. That's what you know. Yeah, if it was one level, I'd be like, yeah, there's something wrong here. You know, Could be. Did it go away? It did go away. It was probably, like you said, it was probably a viral was syndrome. Not, I wasn't sure. She's, she sort of seemed, I, 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 I don't want to say flaky, but she seemed to have a pain out of proportion to what I was seeing. You know, she was fine, but she was missing school. You know, she was out of school. I'm like, you're kidding me. You're not going you know, to, no, it's terrible pain. I can't go to school. Yeah, if your facets are inflamed, that hurts. Right. So I think that's kind of normal. Yeah. 
but I think it was just sort of a, a post-viral syndrome or something. You know, she seemed to have gotten better. You know, it's like, could you take some anti-inflammatories? And she took mm -hmm. some anti-inflammatories. I see it all the time. And you know, you know what pediatricians call it? They call it um, growing pains because yeah. they don't have no idea what it is. Right. And, and the, that's okay with parents. Like, oh, kids are growing, so it hurts maybe sometimes. But I think it's a viral. Right. It's a it's a transient viral. Just like in hips, it's a big deal. Because it's the, yeah, because the kids, if they lose their hip from bacterial infection, that's a big problem. So that's why we've studied it, like transient, um, what's it called? Transient synovitis of the hip. Yeah, transient, we've studied the hip because we're always really worried about it. But we haven't studied the facet joint, we haven't studied the knee or the ankle because, you know, it, it's not as important. Yeah, and there's also not the highest association of uh, infection. And sepsis. Blood flow. Uh, yeah. You know, so the hip is unique. So I don't think the hip is some kind of special joint that always gets a viral syndrome. I think all the joints can get viral no, syndrome. No, it is, but, it's, but it is unique in that it has a higher incidence of uh, septic arthritis because of the way the, it has end arterials. Well, you get them in tibia. You get in tibias and knees. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, you can. You get them in anywhere, but it, it's more common in the hip or the talus. You know, they're like four bones where, where they have end, uh, end arterioles where they're more likely to get sepsis. And that's why the hip is so common. And it's, it's important to differentiate sepsis from transient synovitis. All right, any other uh, comments? Or? So what, we didn't finish the poll. Um, we did the Super Bowl predictions. Doug? Uh, I'm, I'm not a fan of pro sports, especially Super Bowl. I think it's... Uh, Ooh, you have to, you're boring. Megan? <laughs> I'll go with the Ravens. You know, How many points? Monday, I'm going to be the same, no matter who wins or loses. No, you're not. How many <laughs> points, <laughs> Megan? <laughs> but I've decided that these guys don't play. They're not good sports anymore. Get out of here. You're talking bad stuff about the Ravens? I'm you can, you can leave the room. Football. You know what they do? What? They try to make career-ending hits. They don't try to make good no, hits anymore. They no, no. The NFL is soft now. You career. get a 15-yard penalty. Come look, on. Look, been there, watching was football? Coach, there was a coach in where New Orleans, New Orleans that was offering bounties for what? Career-ending hits? Paid his, he paid his dues. He's back. Did he go to jail? No, he, no. he was off for a year, but he's he back. Dick Carr, what's pay your prediction? Paid his dues? Ravens? Wow. How many points? Oh, he must be hurting. 60? 60, Ravens? 16. 60, 60, 40 percentage right back. Uh, oh, 64, he's giving his All right, odds. Plus, How about you, Nate? Plus, what do they call it when you add another one? What's uh, your prediction? Or something like that. <laughs> What's your prediction, Nate? 17.3. Right. Nate, your prediction? 17.3. 17? 17 points. They're like four point under. Man, I hope so. All right. All right, see you guys next Thank month. You. Oh, thanks for.